uh, thanks for joining us. So as mentioned, I'm Angela, and we're going to be talking today about uh, COVID-19 transmission and risk mitigation in multi-unit residential buildings, henceforth MERBs, so I don't have to keep saying that. So this work is based on a paper that we put out in April, which now feels like it was about 10 years ago. Uh, if you haven't had the chance already, the NCCH has been working extremely hard to kind of redirect the information tsunami into useful channels for our uh, environmental health practitioners. You may have already found our COVID-19 topic page on our website, uh, which is where we're linking to resources. Oh boy, this is gonna be a real problem. Which is where we're linking to resources on uh, that we, we're gathering from a range of public health um, websites, about 50 different sites. And they're basically being linked to on our page and they're being sorted according to practice areas. We also have our own documents on there. So those are things like the disease backgrounder we've recently done. We've done some topic pages on building reopening. Of course, the MERBS document. We've got a guide to masking, another paper on outdoor safety, uh, some blogs on, a blog on hand sanitizer, which I forgot to put on here. But uh, I also just recently did a blog on acrylic partitions, best practices for designing, installing, and cleaning them because acrylic partitions are basically in every guidance, but nobody seems to know the best way to build them. So you can find that at, at our blog. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to be focusing on a few high-level topics. Um, the first one is really what do we know about COVID-19 transmission? And so this is something that I, I tend to spend time on because it's it's understanding it is really quite key to understanding why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we'll talk about what that transmission information means for MERBs. Talk about cleaning disinfection, although not as much as some of you may want. <laughs> And we're also going to be talking about just generally promoting health through indoor air quality, which is my way of saying we're going to talk about ventilation. Uh, so SARS-CoV-2, which is the technical name for this particular coronavirus, has five potential modes of transmission. Those are uh, direct contact and uh, respiratory droplets are the primary modes that we're, we, we know are, are driving the vast majority of this, the growth of this pandemic. Um, uh, indirect contact through contaminated surfaces is uh, could also be pretty important based on what we know about other respiratory diseases. So we assume that environmental cleaning is very important. However, the roles of aerosols and fecal shedding, uh, those are two kind of off on the side topics that uh, the role of these two uh, these two modes is quite unclear. So I'm going to be spending quite some time today talking about respiratory droplets and aerosols because there is a lot of very confusing information out there and it has very large implications for how we manage indoor settings of all types whether that's condos or long-term care facilities or gym classes so probably the biggest concern that comes up is whether the virus is airborne by which most people just mean it's it's in the air somehow so there have been a number of pretty troubling environmental and lab studies that have raised some very valid concerns Initially, there were some lab studies that found that artificially generated SARS-CoV-2 aerosols could remain infectious as aerosols, remain suspended and infectious in the air and on surfaces for many, many hours. So these studies used lab equipment to create very uniform aerosols under ideal conditions. So it's really not clear whether or not humans would generate an aerosol like that. That said, people absolutely do generate aerosols. And there have been a number of modeling and chamber studies that have visualized droplet generation from people talking or shouting or laughing, uh, both recently and for about 10 years before the, the pandemic, we've been, this kind of area has been investigated. However, um, what we don't know is whether every droplet carries the virus and what concentration of virus-laden aerosol or virus-carrying aerosol is produced under which conditions, at which stage in the disease, these are all things that we, we don't understand. The aerosol itself is not as important as the virus on it, so that's important to remember. We also know that viral RNA has been found in the air and on surfaces in hospitals and all types of care centers. So the presence of that RNA uh, doesn't mean the virus is still infectious when they capture it. It's, it's basically, it's just the marker that it was there. It doesn't mean you could still get infected from it. But we need to know that. We need to know how long that virus in the air remained infectious, how far it traveled, how easy it is to get an infectious dose just by breathing air, where, when, how, and uh, did anybody get sick from it? So we can find virus in the air, but it doesn't mean anybody actually got sick from that virus. So again, the virus is more important than the aerosol. So 
is the virus airborne and what does that mean? Well, the main problem is that that word airborne means different things to different people. Within the world of infectious disease, it's generally accepted to mean a pathogen that transmits easily or even preferentially as an aerosol and is able to do it over long distances, longer distances and expanded periods of time. So the classic example of this is measles. So this, this thing back here is not coronavirus, that's actually the measles virus. And this is a, a little baby who has had the bad luck to get measles. Um, <clears throat> measles is the, the classic example of a, a pathogen that transmits as a long lived aerosol that remains infectious for up to a couple of hours. And because of this expanded exposure window, both in terms of time and space, you can catch measles, measles from someone even if you've never been in the same room as them. So that's really quite important. Um, this is also an incredibly contagious virus. If you have measles and you decide to socialize with 10 other people who have never had it, then you can expect to infect eight, nine or 10 of those people. So measles has a basic reproductive number of somewhere around 12 to 18, which is much higher than what we think COVID is. And uh, it's still killing around 160 children, 160,000 children around the world every year, which we expect sadly to get much worse because COVID is now interrupting uh, vaccination programs around the world. So back to COVID, um, another reason that we have so much confusion over this airborne transmission thing is that we are getting a bit hung up on these very arbitrary cutoffs that are thought or they're used to define the behavior of certain airborne particles. So in this slide here, we're going to really break it down and we're going to try to understand these droplets as a spectrum rather than as categories. So at the larger end of the spectrum up here, you have the, the larger droplets. Those are the gobs, gobs <laughs> of mucus and cells and virus that are usually being referred to as respiratory droplets with a lower cutoff of about five microns. Although some authors actually say that this cutoff should be higher, it should be 10 or it should be 20. So there's there's debate about these cutoffs, which is why they're maybe not super, super useful. Uh, at the other end are these smaller droplets, which are, are often being referred to as aerosols. And so that's for this table, it's anything less than five, but some people may consider anything less than 10. What's important is that both of these size classes are being produced by common activities, but the amount of droplet produced and the range of sizes produced really depends on the activity itself. So breathing is producing the fewest and also the smallest particles. But as you increase in intensity through talking, singing, laughing, shouting, uh, to coughing and finally sneezing, the number and size of droplets created are getting larger and they're going farther. So <clears throat> the, the largest particles um, are what's on about 100 microns are what's on called a ballistic trajectory, a bullet trajectory. So they basically, they hang for a few seconds and then they hit the ground within a few feet. Those are the ones that are really just, they kind of curve down and hit you on the shoes, essentially. And they're, those um, ballistic particles, as well as the smaller ones that are around 10 microns, those are all settling out due to gravity. These are things that fall. Uh, 10 micron particles may take minutes to fall, but they're still falling due to gravity. On the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum here, the smaller particles are floating for minutes to hours. They are traveling farther and they're removed by different processes like impaction, which is smacking up against a wall or elect electrostatic attraction or other processes. They're not settling out because of gravity. In terms of how they infect us, uh, the largest droplets are either landing on your hands and face and then you, you know touch something or they are they're a bit smaller, kind of around like the 10 to 20 micron level, then they're actually able to be inhaled in your, in your airstream. When you, when you if they enter your breathing zone and you inhale, you're gonna pull those droplets with you. Um, and those are generally uh, infecting the upper airway, uh, whereas the smaller particles down at this end, those are, the, those are actually able to make it deepest into the lungs. So the smaller it is, the deeper it goes, which is concerning in terms of establishing an infection, but, there's some important caveats here, and these are the things that I think don't get reflected very well when we communicate about risk here. The first thing is that uh, those larger particles, uh, they don't go as far and they fall faster, and they're also much more likely to carry one or more variants. So we need to actually get an infectious dose in order to establish an infection, and we're not totally sure what that infectious dose is. I've seen ranges of numbers, um, but the, the really key point is the larger particle is the more likely that is to actually carry a virus. Okay. 
Whereas those smaller particles, they remain suspended longer and they travel farther, but they are much less likely to carry even one variant. So you can be inhaling aerosols from somebody who's sick and yet perhaps not be inhaling their viruses. Um, so the kind of the, the general message here is that for the larger particles, you've got to be closer to catch these, but they are the riskier droplets. Whereas the farther you are away, the less likely you are to, um, to capture enough to actually get an infection. So what does this look like in the real world? So you have your sick person here, and that person is expelling all sorts of uh, <laughs> sorts and sizes of droplets. The really heavy ones are these ones here. They're you know around 100 microns, and they're on the ballistic trajectory, so they're falling down right away uh, within a few feet. They're really not going that far. Whereas the rest of them, everything kind of 100 microns and under, are borne along in this puff here. And so. Um, Here's you <laughs> standing right in, center, right in front of that puff, so that's not a great place to be. Uh, you have to note that at close range, we really can't distinguish whether a person is getting sick from inhaling these larger droplets or the smaller droplets, because of course they're inhaling both. But the larger droplets, uh, the larger the droplet is, the greater the likelihood that it's carrying one or more virions, and so the larger droplets are inherently more risky. So there's a substantial difference from inhaling a thousand of these large droplets versus a thousand of these small droplets. Um, which is kind of what the, the authors of this paper, this is a great paper, Wei and Lee, it's from 2016. It's, it's really quite excellent. Journal of, Journal of, Infectious, Journal of Infection Control. Yeah. Um, so it's not very likely that these viruses out here, because they're so much smaller and less likely to carry uh, a virion, they're less likely to be actually establishing an infection, but they can certainly be augmenting an, an infection that is already going to be mostly caused by these droplets. So it's not possible to really um, separate these two. On the other hand, way over here, this guy, this guy, he's well out of that kind of concentrated cloud of aerosols. He's still inhaling some, but is it enough to cause an infection? So if that infection is measles, then the answer is probably yes, because that's how measles works. But what about COVID? So to answer that, we need to look at basically outbreak investigations. So I'm not going to cover everything that's been done here because that's, that's impossible. It's growing every day, but I'm going to cover kind of the large salient points. Um, so in the initial studies on uh, about a couple of months ago, these came out about the, the initial 75,000 cases in China and the US, they found that most of the transmission was within families. Okay? Usually the caregiver or the spouse that gets sick because they're in the closest contact and very rarely children, because of course you don't use children to care for sick people. Um, overall though, the household secondary attack rate, which is the percentage of people in your home that gets the illness after you've been in there being sick, is quite low. It varies from about 0.5% to 20%, depending on things like whether a family has a, an, a bedroom to isolate a person on, where the person in, whether they have PPE, whether they know how to care for a sick person. It varies a lot. But that's pretty low compared to something like measles, for example. Uh, a, house, a household full of um, people who have never had measles would experience much more illness. We also know that um, we do see some outbreaks in kind of like residential settings, um, but these always have an interactive component. So uh, things like shared caregivers or social programming, which in, in seniors' homes, even in independent living seniors' homes, because they have the kind of social programming that brings people together, puts them on the bus to the grocery store, the, to the casino. Those are things that bring people together and increase the risk of an outbreak. And then you have uh, other living situations, congregate living situations like worker camps and dorms and prisons where they're sharing just, a, they're interacting, but they're also sharing bathrooms, they're sharing kitchens, lounges, bedrooms. Obviously in a prison, you're sharing all of those things and there's no door. So it's really um, very difficult to control an infection in that environment. We're also seeing a number of outbreaks where we've got transmission in workplaces where people aren't necessarily touching and maybe aren't even very close to another one another, which does implicate a kind of short range droplet and or aerosol transmission. So some examples of that are, um, there was like a, a restaurant study that a lot of people have looked at where basically an air conditioner in train droplets and blew them down a line of people. Um, the Washington choir outbreak, um, there was a, a call center in Korea that had quite a large outbreak. And uh, this Zumba class, that was a really interesting one also from Korea, where basically it seemed to show that the intensity level of the class was a factor in the spread of the disease. So. 
uh, the disease spread, it was basically some fitness instructors got infected and they taught different kinds of classes. And the disease seemed to spread in the Zumba class, but not in the yoga or Pilates classes. So in that, in that situation, it was kind of a, a thing where people were huffing and puffing, producing those larger, riskier droplets, and then moving back and forth, dancing back and forth through each other's plumes, as one does in a Zumba class. And that resulted in a bunch of infections. So that's, like, again, they're not touching. And maybe they're even two meters apart, but there's these kind of extenuating circumstances where they were moving back and forth through each other's clouds of those higher risk droplets. So I have yet to see any evidence of aerosol transmission or massive outbreaks in uh, multi-unit residential buildings like apartment buildings or condos. And this is where people are sharing some common areas, but their households are effectively separate. So they're not sharing bathrooms and kitchens and you know, they're, they're, they're able to actually effectively isolate themselves from each other. So that doesn't mean that condo outbreaks aren't happening or can't happen. I'm sure that under certain circumstances they could, but it's a very good sign that after four or five months of this virus kind of running wild, um, but they haven't really manifested themselves as such yet. yet. Uh, it's also really informative about the disease itself and how to manage it. So coming back to this figure, what we know so far really supports this kind of short range exposure, exposure route, whether via droplets or droplets with some aerosols also augmenting the infection. Um, short range aerosol transmission is definitely or most likely also a part of this. Um, but are we seeing this kind of long range aerosol transmission over here? And um, the answer to that right now, as far as I can see, is no. Uh, or at least certainly not like other airborne diseases that can affect people who have never been in the same place at the same time. But because your risk is really proportional to the degree of exposure that you're receiving, by the amount of time you receive it for, you could potentially create extreme situations where aerosols begin to play a bigger role on their own. So a really bad example, or a really good but terrible example of that would be, for example, a prison outbreak, where you would have a very high percentage of sick people producing droplets all the time, but you don't have doors on the cells. <laughs> so you can't control, you can't isolate people properly, you can't prevent aerosols or droplets from moving out to corridors and that's you don't have ventilation appropriate for like a that would be more appropriate for a hospital setting so that is a situation where those aerosols where they may not play an important role in a normal setting in an extreme setting could start to become dangerous so what does all this mean for MERS so the key message from the data is really that closeness really does matter same type same time same place is really important um, we are absolutely transmitting via droplets, large and small, but being in the same place at the same time seems to be like very key to that. So in, in the, the common areas of these uh, multi-unit residential buildings, we need to just keep people away from each other. And that so far in most buildings that I've, I've been in contact with or people have contacted me, it means like closing amenities, closing the gym, the pool, the rec room, the pool room, like billiards room. Uh, limiting elevator access, uh, discouraging gatherings, like telling people don't linger by the mailbox, get your mail and move on down to your suite because we don't want you here. Things like that. Um, and also just enhancing cleaning. So generally people are, are really trying to clean the high touch surfaces more frequently. Uh, they're also, or we have made a really big effort to promote this idea of, of not allowing cross contamination in laundry rooms and washrooms. So some of the older buildings still have shared laundries. And, you know, laundry could be an issue because you could, you could have potentially sheets or bedding coming from a sick person's uh, room and being set on top of a washer or dryer. Once the sheets or whatever it is are inside the washer and being washed, the soap and water take care of everything. So you, you don't need to worry about what's inside the drum. You need to worry what's outside on the machine. So we put together a poster, um, which is on our topic page, which has been really well received. It, it just basically covers, um, you know, how to use a laundry room safely with others and uh, you know what you do have to worry about what you don't have to worry about so if you want to check that out it's on our topic page uh, we also need to communicate with residents uh, about cleaning procedures about not lingering uh, just trying to reinforce health messaging generally uh, you know it's a, it's a real problem where you have a building with a bunch of residents and people are not communicating about uh, pandemic control measures because that just creates a lot of fear and it's just completely unnecessary. 
Uh, you also need to keep people healthy and comfortable in their homes. And so I'm mentioning this because it relates to ventilation, which I'm going to talk about later on, but it also relates to things like extreme heat. So one of the other things I'm working on right now is a set of guidelines for extreme heat and smoke conditions when you may also have COVID around. And so that can be a real challenge because some buildings like to set up cooling rooms in the basement or the rec room. And how can you safely do that if there's potential to have COVID in the building? So it's one of the things that we're going to be looking at next. So regarding the cleaning and disinfection, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada, FAC, FAC, PHAC, recommends just cleaning manually with soap and water and or an approved disinfectant. So a lot of people out there are using two-in-one wipes, which is totally fine. They do both cleaning and disinfection. But some key messages for your communities that you may want to um, promote are things like the necess necessity of doing both cleaning and disinfecting and uh, also wiping off the disinfectant. Some people are not following, uh, this has come to our attention, not following label instructions. They're putting the disinfectant on then just leaving it. And that could be, you know, it might not be such a problem on, on an elevator panel, but it could be a real problem if you're doing it on a tanning bed or something like that. So in a, like a PSC setting, it might be more important, but um, people generally need to use those disinfectants very, very carefully. And there's there's been some issues with that. I've also heard about some uh, cleaning companies going out and buying really expensive like hospital disinfectants and this is also just not necessary. The virus is easy to kill and when in doubt Health Canada has put together their uh, very handy product list. Frequency wise I've seen recommendations to be cleaning high high touch areas in buildings one to three times a day so this could be a very very challenging for most kind of with most verbs because it's very difficult right now to get a cleaner um, five times a week, never mind, have them doing the same services three times a day. So some people have been emailing me, they're trying to, um, you know, use owners to do it or people who live in the building. And, you know, that's something you kind of have to work out on your own. But uh, generally, uh, the kind of range for recommendations, one to three. I also had a question about vacuuming that came in uh, because vacuums can kick up a lot of dust. So what's important for vacuuming is that the machine has a HEPA exhaust filter and that the exhaust is diffuse, which means that it doesn't it doesn't exhaust and like shoot a jet up into your face or down onto the carpet where it, where it could aerosolize particles. I don't think that this is a huge risk. I don't believe that that vacuuming the common area is going to be causing outbreaks. Um, but if people are concerned about um, vacuuming then they should generally be using a HEPA filter anyway because it's really not great for cleaning staff to be inhaling dust from a, a dusty vacuum bag that's shooting up into their face. Um, all right, so just a note on poisonings. Um, so poison control centers here in Canada and in the US are seeing a real uptick. Um, they're mostly related to bleach, both due to mixing with other agents, and then there's other people who are just using very excessive levels, um, like very, very, they're just, either they're, they're not understanding how to dilute or they're they're just thinking more is better, more is better. This is not the case. Uh, on our topic page, we actually link to a chlorine dilution calculator just to help people figure out. Most people just don't know how to get it dilute enough. Um, there's also been, unfortunately, a few cases related to swallowing hand sanitizer. And this is obviously, this is children who are doing this. Uh, hand sanitizers are uh, pretty toxic if you swallow them. They're a very high concentration of alcohol. And so they, sh they need to be, um, everything needs to be stored properly. So first follow the label on those products, don't mix them and store them securely. We actually have um, a recent blog on our NCCH webpage about hand sanitizers and how to use them properly. Uh, there's actually a surprising number of things that can go wrong. So just a note, hand sanitizer, good on the outside, not so great on the inside. So that's just our, our resources there. Um, spraying and fogging has also been in the news. Um, people are doing this both indoors and outdoors with a variety of products. Um, this practice can be useful in some settings. So I recently saw this being used in, in Vegas casinos because you can imagine like there's, you know, so many buttons and so many surfaces to clean that this is like the, the quickest way that they can do it, I guess. Uh, however, you have to be really careful of this because of issues like having reduced effectiveness on soiled surfaces or on poor surfaces. Um, some products may also trigger chemical sensitivities. Um, so generally, if you have to get approval from residents of a building to do this, it can be it can be difficult to do. People don't generally like the idea of spraying disinfectants everywhere or having other people spray them and then they have to inhale them. 
Uh, so overall, as as Fack has pointed out, it's just elbow grease, manual cleaning is best. And uh, yeah, this is from a, I don't even know if this is real or not. <laughs> this was uh, supposedly something that was set up outside a workplace in China where they were just like dousing people going into work. I, I, I don't know, but don't do that. If anybody is thinking about doing that, that's, that's a no. It's a hard no right there. Um, okay, so personal protective equipment is a really big issue for cleaning staff, custodial and cleaning staff in buildings, or you know, if, if residents are getting together and doing their own cleaning. Uh, the best advice here is that cleaning staff should always be using PPE according to the label on the disinfectant product, and that usually means gloves. Um, using disposable products like disposable wipes and disposable gloves is fine, but it is also okay to use reusable rags and gloves. So for reusable rags, it's fine to use them as long as you wash them and dry them hot, they're fine. You can use that again. And same for, we had some people here that were having a really hard time getting gloves uh, about a month ago. And uh, so for them, we just said, you know, it's okay to use kitchen gloves, just take them off carefully, let them wash your hands with them on, take them off carefully, let them dry, and then don't use them for any other purpose. Uh, regarding masks, masking depends on a number of factors. Uh, most times custodial staff in these residential buildings are not actually near people, uh, and so he or she may not need a, a mask at all. Um, however, if the person is doing something that creates a lot of dust, which is where my vacuuming thing kept coming up, um, we want to just generally avoid inhaling dust and creating aerosols right now, but like just for occupational health and safety, custodial staff should not be, should be masked if they're doing something that creates a lot of dust. Um, also, people are choosing to wear the non-medical masks and facial coverings, which is it's totally fine. Uh, we actually recently had a break-in in my building where the person uh, broke into a bunch of cars and was wearing, so responsibly, was wearing their PPE so we couldn't identify who it was, <laughs> even though we caught them on video. Anyway, that's, that's definitely a con of masking. Um, all right. So ventilation. Ventilation is one area where this discussion on the larger and smaller droplets becomes really relevant because, of course, Everybody wants to find a technological solution to this problem, and unfortunately, it's just not going to be that easy. Um, because most of the transmission is occurring between two closely interacting humans, good ventilation is at best going to be an environmental support. It's not going to be a solution to the problem. I, I don't think anybody actually really believes that. Um, so it's also uh, really important to consider that the kind of the role of ventilation in public health um, the public health response to COVID is really dependent on the setting. So today I'm just talking about the residential buildings. And so that you can kind of break it down into what happens in suites versus what happens in the whole building. Okay, just, just based on what we know about where transmission occurs. So for, for residential buildings, the greatest role for ventilation is in the suites with the sick people. And so what is generally being recommended is that those sick people should be isolated in a room with a door that can close so that you can isolate the air spaces. Uh, then the, the sick room uh, should be ventilated, whether that's through opening windows, uh, opening windows all the time, opening windows periodically, or uh, some of the newer, newer buildings will have in-suite ventilation that can be controlled. You can turn off the recirc mode and just increase the outdoor air being brought in. So the sick room should be ventilated, and then also the rest of the home should be ventilated too, but independently of, of each other. So the door between those two areas needs to be closed. Uh, ASHRAE is recommending the use of air cleaners. So air cleaners are portable air cleaners. You know, theoretically, they have the filter filtration capacity to take out very small particles that could be carry carrying viruses. Um, some people think that this may be overkill. However, I'm also very cognizant that the, the poor air quality season is coming up, whether due to heat or to forest fire. And we know that air cleaners have a big benefit there. So getting an air cleaner, it's not a bad thing. I'm not going to say that it's going to have like some sort of clinical effect in terms of reducing the number of COVID um, infections that can happen within a home. That's not something that we can support, but it's in general, it might be a good idea. Uh, and finally, uh, remembering that the heaviest slash riskiest droplets are those really big ones, and those are the ones that are falling straight to the floor or to whatever surface you're on, the bed, whatever. So uh, surface cleaning, environmental cleaning, it is important. Uh, I know that recently the CDC kind of downgraded their language on the importance of fomites or indirect um, transmission, but uh, 
it's not, uh, it wasn't really a downgrade. It was kind of portrayed that way in the media. It's really just saying what we have always said, which is that uh, droplets and contact are the main modes of transmission and then fomites is probably important. It's certainly not something that should be ignored. So at the building level, um, <clears throat> Uh, so just because the transmission uh, seems to require that close interaction, we're kind of less worried about what's happening at the building level. And so that would include um, the common areas and the garages and, and just areas that people can share, but they're not lingering in. They're, they're moving through them quickly and they're going to their suites. So um, just based on what we know about transmission for those areas, um, we would say that for, currently there's no... Uh, major modifications being recommended for the ventilation systems. Uh, the main message is just to ensure that those systems are maintained and functioning as they were designed to do. So ventilation systems are designed to bring clean air in and push dirty air out. And so that is just good for indoor air quality and health in general. So um, uh, general good practice then is just to increase the outdoor air fraction. Another issue that came to my attention through a collaborator is that people were actually shutting off their building ventilation altogether. Uh, a lot of older buildings still use this thing called um, corridor pressurization, which is where you have basically a roof fan that pushes air into a corridor, and then that air gets pushed under the door into the suite and then out through the envelope of the building. So people thought that by turning that off, they were going to present or they were going to prevent the virus, uh, any virus that was potentially present in the hall, from being pushed into the suite. Of course, people are not lingering in the hall, so there's there's a very, 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 very low probability of any virus in the hall. So what this action actually has in terms of impact is by uh, removing corridor pressurization, then you have air from the suites leaking out into the common areas, and that's definitely not something you want. Um, if anything, that increases the risk to the building because a true airborne disease would then be able to seep out and get into the halls and infect others. Okay. Again, however, COVID transmission does not appear to be airborne in that way. It appears to be very strongly dependent on close interaction, same time, same place. So this scenario is unlikely. At the same time, though, these um, ventilation systems need to be running or are supposed to be running. They're designed to be running 24-7 anyway, just for the fact that we need ventilation in the units, but also for smoke control in case of a fire. So some buildings turn this off, um, not just because of COVID, some building turn off their roof fan at night because of energy saving. They want to save all the electricity from the fan overnight. Also, that's not intended or not how that system was intended to run. Um, if people from buildings want to make changes, it's very important to push them very solidly towards an HVAC professional, partly for what I've just said, is if people start making modifications or trying to change filters, there's a lot of different things that they can do to really impact ventilation, which could have health impacts. So it's uh, like unintended consequences kind of situation. Uh, we also have a um, building shutdown and reopening page that has some of these resources on it, if you're interested. So I think I'm almost out of time. Oh my gosh, I got lots of time. So we got lots of time for questions. Um, yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Tina. Great, thanks, Angela. So we'll move on to questions. Um, uh, first couple of questions are about disinfecting um, using ozone generating devices and electrostatic spraying. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, do you know anything about those, Angela? Well, generally the, the ozone, ozonation technologies are just not being recommended because they're a respiratory irritant and you don't want to trade one problem for another. So that's like, I have seen no good things said about using ozone for in this particular situation. Uh, I mean, keep in mind that we are talking about residential buildings here. So um, yeah, th there could be certain settings in which an ozone sprayer, like maybe if it was like at night and then the building was unoccupied all night or occupied for a weekend, maybe it would be okay, but not for a residential building. On the question of the elect electrostatic sprayers, that has come to the NCCH's attention and I think somebody's working on it, but I don't wanna comment on it right now because I just don't know. Okay. Um, next question, um, what is the infectious dose of COVID-19? I don't think anybody knows at this point. Yeah, no, it's, I've heard numbers from like several hundred virions to several thousand virions, and it's something that, um, it, it's a very difficult piece of information to come by. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll know more later, but for right now, um, it's not one, right? You can be exposed to 
to a few viruses and that's not enough. We know that it's some greater number that you have to cumulatively get that amount in your body before an, an infection is established. And it's not a hard threshold either. There's gonna be some people whose threshold is much lower. As we know, the, the elderly, uh, sick people, uh, and then other people, they're gonna have much more resistance, but it's, it's uh, there is some sort of uh, dose that has to be achieved before people are gonna get sick. Okay, thanks. Um, what about um, triggering asthma and chemical sensitivities? Um, would fragrance-free and chlorine-free antiseptics and disinfectants be preferred? Uh, this has definitely come up with a lot of, um, I've been just receiving a lot of questions via email and this has come, out, come up a lot. And basically people, it was most people who were using bleach and mm -hmm. then they turned around and they just, they found different products. Then they went to one, I think that had like a lot of limonene in it. It was some sort of like lemon fresh. It had a DIN number. It was still a pretty powerful, um, a pretty powerful disinfectant. And that was still causing problems with chemical sensitivities. And then I think they actually went to like dish soap and water because um, the virus is, it's, it's an envelope virus. It doesn't take much to kill it. Soap and water will get rid of it. So, you know, if it's, you know, people have to make their own their own choices there. And uh, yeah, definitely chemical sensitivities have been a problem. And burns, yeah. I guess, it just burns and like people not wearing gloves and disinfectants are powerful, powerful products. You need to be careful when you use them and only use them when you need to. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question. What about window air conditioners? The public seems to be asking about risk um, when using these in their buildings. I guess units. the question is risk to who? If it's a risk of, um, like some air conditioners recirculate air and some don't. So if it's an air conditioner that you've got a sick person in your home and then you're recirculate, you're using an air conditioner and you're recirculating their sick air into your living space, then I would say that's a bad idea. If people are worried about having an air conditioner where they're drawing in outside air and they're worried about sickness coming from other units and coming in through their air conditioner, I would say, that's probably an incredibly low risk. I would not be highly concerned about that. It's really about the people who, with whom you have close interactions. And if you've got a sick person in your house, then yeah, ventilation is something you, you should think about, but it's not, um, it's not a, a situation where you're gonna see risk between units. Does that, does that answer the question kind of? Yeah, I, I believe so, if, uh, if not. With a questioner, please clarify or add to their question. Okay, next one I received, uh, it was a private question um, about the initial infectious dose of the virus and how that impacts how quickly one gets sick or the severity of the symptoms um, or is there a minimum threshold of particles which causes sickness and the severity it depends on the individual's immune system. Yeah, I mean, all those things are, are assumed to be factors. The research that I've seen right now is really more about your viral load, your viral load at different stages in your illness. So, uh, I mean, nobody nobody really knows the infectious dose that a person receives when they get sick, because like I, I showed in that, that um, diagram, like, is he getting sick because he caught a couple of big droplets or because he caught a whole bunch of aerosols? Like, it's not, it's not really, nobody knows what they got sick from. You can only study the disease after that point. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, obviously that's not the case in outbreak <laughs> investigations, but it, it, that's, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I haven't seen anything that would answer that particular question. Okay, next question. Uh, will the slides be available? Yes, the slides will be posted on the NCC, NCCEH website, as well as the video recording. Okay, next question is about fecal contamination. Um, given that SARS was initially spread through aerosolization of malfunctioning sewers, could there be a risk to cleaners who have to clean um, visibly soiled surfaces with fecal material present? Okay, that's a really good question. Uh, the Amoy Gardens uh, incident in Hong Kong, which killed a lot of people, um, it was kind of a kind of a unusual situation. There, it was a plumbing system where they had made vent or they had made. Um, Modifications to the plumbing system. They had dried drains, so there was no water in the in the trap. And then some owners had also installed some really really powerful exhaust fans in their bathrooms. And this created kind of a perfect storm, whereas or where um, just like the pressure changes in the building, even on a windy day, were actually causing uh, aerosolization from the pipes up into the suites, which was then 
affecting the suites, but also being blown out into the air, which traveled downwind and affected other buildings. So this was um, a really serious situation uh, involving like a kind of a combination of factors. Thus far for this pandemic, um, the only recommendation that I've seen is it's actually from ASHRAE and it's, I think it was ASHRAE. And it's really just to make sure that um, uh, drains are kept uh, filled with water or that you don't have like a bubbling toilet. For example, if you've got horizontal drains and buildings are becoming clogged up, sometimes that can cause the ground floor toilets to bubble. And that, you know, might potentially be an issue, but the, that kind of like um, combination of factors is not really the general concern. The, the concern that I think most people are worried about are toilet plumes, which is uh, every time you flush the toilet, that, that action, that vortex that's created actually creates a little plume of aerosols that goes up in the air. And we know that um, people are, are shedding SARS-CoV-2 in their feces and that they can be shedding that virus even for quite some period after the respiratory portion of the infection has cleared up. So I think one study found it was something, it was, I think it was almost two or three months where some people were still releasing uh, virus in their feces, even though they were fine otherwise. So, I mean, where does that become a problem? It becomes a problem for shared washrooms. And it, there's a bit of a combination of factors there too, where a person uses the toilet, flushes the toilet, the toilet creates a plume. And then at the other end of the washroom, which is probably not that well ventilated, there's a jet dryer and the jet dryer entrains those aerosols and then blows them directly onto somebody's damp hands, which they think are clean. So this is you know, a, a potential situation where there could be some problems. So recommendations include things like obviously increasing ventilation to washrooms, uh, removing the jet dryers and, and replacing them with paper towel, um, having lids on toilets is another thing. Obviously, you know, you would hope that sick people aren't at work, but if, if their respiratory infection has cleared up and they're back at work, then, you know, it may not be avoidable. So the NCCH is working on some sort of um, discussion of this, at least. I'm not sure that there's any evidence to actually back up practice, but it's, um, it's something that we've, we've received a lot of questions about. For things like park bathrooms, um, one really problem that I, I've noticed is restaurants and parks closing bathrooms because they don't want to be responsible for cleaning them and or they're afraid that people will um, like get sick there and like they, they just don't have the staff to maintain them clean. This is a really big problem because if you're shutting bathrooms in, in parks or, or even restaurants, then you are eliminating the chance for hand hygiene and that is not good. So, you know, we, we want people to be aware and careful of washrooms and think about them as an environment that needs to be cleaned uh, and perhaps assessed, but we don't want people so afraid of other people using their washrooms that they shut them down. That would be a mistake. Okay, uh, next question. Is hydrogen peroxide a good choice for wiping down surfaces and that it can be sprayed on and left to dry? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's many, many different hydrogen peroxide products out there and also in white form. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I don't really want to give a recommendation on particular cleaners, but it, it is one of the accepted or slash acceptable or approved um, yeah. product that types on it. Canada's yeah. list. Oh, actually, yeah, Tina, you would know way more about that than me. Tina here wrote a great uh, document on uh, cleaners and disinfectants for the house, right, Tina? All right, Tina? Uh, yeah, hydrogen peroxide is an option <laughs> for cleaning SARS-CoV or killing SARS-CoV-2, but I would recommend checking out the Health Canada website for approved products. And that uh, document is on our topic page as well. And it's a, it's a really good one, Tina. Thanks. <laughs> um, what about UV lights in areas where people might gather such as around elevators? Okay. Uh, I believe, right? The thing that you're, you're talking about is probably not a UV light, but a UVGI upper air or upper room air cleaner. And essentially these things, they, they suck in air, the UV irradiate the crap out of it, and then they put it back out. Um, those kinds of devices are more typically seen in like hospital or clinical settings, like doctor's office waiting rooms. Um, I, in residential buildings, I don't see that the traffic is enough or that the, the number of infected people is enough. It's kind of a large, tech, a large investment money-wise. I don't necessarily think that it would be justified in a residential building, but 
for other kind of healthcare settings, then it's definitely something that's being looked at. Okay, next question. Could the central air um, conditioning system itself and its filter be contaminated by the virus and spread the virus? During windy days, do you see, are there any concerns about larger aerosols being carried by the wind and a need for extra physical distancing? Hmm. Hmm. I don't want to comment too much on particular ventilation systems because it's incredibly building dependent. And I would say that you should, for whoever is asking that question, like whatever building it pertains to, that building should most certainly consult with an HVAC consultant. However, uh, once uh, the virus is outside, the, the solution to pollution is dilution. So in this case, any kind of natural ventilation or dilution of that virus, I, I wouldn't necessarily be worried about it being re-entrained into the building. Although, as has been pointed out, the Amoy Gardens uh, incident in, in Hong Kong, it was an exhaust from bathrooms being carried by the wind and picked up by other units. So that's not, not a good situation. However, I mean, this is, yeah, I would definitely say talk to an HVAC person about that particular setup. And what about aerosols outside being carried by the wind and need for extra physical distancing? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, once people are outside, you have to consider how teeny, 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 teeny those aerosols are, and they may not even be carrying a virus. So uh, we know from kind of like very basic research, looking at where outbreaks happened in China, um, there was something like 318 uh, outbreaks related to indoor settings, and I think one related to an outdoor setting. And the, the important factor in the outdoor setting is crowding. It's, it's not one person creates a bit of aerosol that's carried by the wind. It's a whole bunch of people create, um, you know, and perhaps multiple sick people in that crowd, creating kind of like a localized um, risk area where other people can pick it up. So, yeah, if it's, yeah, I, I would say no. Oh, actually, what that question might be referring to, it might be referring to the study that came out. It was about uh, walking, biking, and jogging, and about the different plumes that are created. Um, that study, it made some interesting points, but again, it didn't really take into like transmission of the virus or infectious dose or things like that. So generally, like, you know, the, the two meter distance is, um, the two meter distance is kind of intended two things. It's intended, first of all, to be used with respiratory etiquette. So the two meter distance does not protect you if somebody is sneezing in your general direction. So the two meter distance is really only functional with respiratory etiquette. And it's really intended not to remove the risk or eliminate the risk of any contact with a person's aerosols, whether they have virus or not. It's intended to uh, reduce your risk of coming into contact with those really risky, heavier droplets, which are the ones that fall closer to the person who emitted them. So yeah, when it comes to that, that space, I know there's been a lot of questions lately about the whole two meter thing. And I, those are just like kind of the two important points that I like to put out there. It's meant to be used with respiratory etiquette. And it's really protecting you just from the biggest risk. It's not eliminating the risk. Okay, next question. Um, this question is about surgical masks, which is kind of outside the context of this presentation. But um, Angela, if you want to do you know anything about it or should we should we maybe refer it oh, to I mean, ask it and then we'll point back to the right resources yeah go ahead oh uh, so okay regarding for surgical masks is there a way to know their effectiveness does a flame test have any credibility uh this test uh is uh, if a flame if a candle goes out after blowing is a mask not good enough hmm. Well, when you say surgical mask, that can be two things. That can be an actual medical ASTM certified surgical procedure mask, or there's all these other masks that look exactly like them, but they're sold at Canadian Tire. They're not considered medical masks. So what I would recommend you do is that you go to the NCCH website to our topic page and find the document written by uh, our colleague, Juliet. It's about, I think it's called masking during the pandemic. And it, it goes through some of that evidence about you know what is protective and what's not. And then also Public Health Ontario on their website, they have uh, two or three really good masking documents as well for, for different settings and also I think for just general non-medical use. Okay, next question. 
Um, it's about uh, other natural products that will kill the virus. Um, again, I would refer you to look at the Health Canada website for uh, disinfectants and other products that were are actually approved and shown to be able to kill the virus. And uh, from that list, you can pick the products that are better suited for your needs. Um, so, okay, so next question is about fecal transmission. Again, um, to clarify, viral RNA has been found in feces, but has viable SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, actually, there was a recent paper that isolated infective, infectious um, SARS-CoV-2 from feces. It was just the one study. Um, you know, it's like science always requires validation and verification, uh, but yeah, it's not surprising that there would be infectious virus there. Okay, uh, next question, are outdoor non-flush washrooms safer? Outdoor non-flush washrooms, like an outhouse, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, outdoor washrooms, like the kind you typically find in parks and campgrounds, they tend to be uh, very well naturally vent ventilated buildings. They'll have like lots of windows or they'll have like lots of just passive vents that may, may not have a door. And so those those buildings are, I mean, even if there are toilet plumes created, those building, buildings are pretty well ventilated. Um, my concern with like, when you start getting to like outdoor or outhouses and things like that is like, are they being cleaned? I think somebody in our, in our unit, I think, is also looking at photo potties and events. So that might be something that we have something to say more about later on. But um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't make a decision on that right now. Okay, next question. Can't is there... Like if you if you can't wash your hands, if you've got a, a non-flush toilet, but that non-flush toilet means you don't have plumbing, which means you don't have a sink, then no, that is not a better choice. Okay. Is there a risk for children catching the virus at outdoor playgrounds? What cleaners are recommended for fruits and vegetables? Um, I'm going to pass on both of those because I like there's like a lot of information about just like survival of the virus in the outdoors and uh, you know the effects of UV and temperature and stuff like that and I, I just I have not had any input from anybody cleaning outdoor playground equipment? Like, is this for a home or is this for like a park? I don't know. That might be something where they try to spray it. Frankly, that that might be something where they go with that, but I haven't heard anything or any recommendations on that so far. And as for the fruits and vegetables, I think there was something on the Public Health Agency of Canada website about it. And it was, um, it was just basically, you know, you don't need to have extreme caution about your fruits and vegetables, but you should be washing them anyway because of, you know, of residues and bugs and stuff like that. So, do you remember where that was? Do you remember where the fruits and vegetables thing came from, Tina? Um, no, I don't remember, but I can look it up. Um, if, uh, if you can email me the questioner or the person who posed this question, you can email me and then we can try to look into it for you. Yeah, certainly the. Um, CDC has also put out guidance on, you know, how you should treat fruits and vegetables and other products that come from the grocery store. But generally speaking, the kind of general word is that there hasn't been any um, identified instances of transmission through that kind of fomite, essentially. Uh, you're much more likely to catch it just by going out in public and interacting with somebody who's sick. Not that that's likely. Right now in BC, a risk is low. But um, yeah, it's, I, I would, advise you to go to the Public Health Agency of Canada website or email us and we'll link you to back into the CDC pages. Yes, generally um, foodborne contamination is not, uh, foodborne transmission is not really a factor for COVID-19. Um, so what, what surfaces should be cleaned in a shared toilet between healthy people and sick people and how often? Well, um, um, sorry, go ahead, Tina. I'm just not sure. Maybe, uh, Melanie, if you can clarify if you're talking about uh, like in a household situation or in a shared toilet uh, in a building situation. Yeah, if it's, um, if it's within the home, Public Health Agency of Canada put out several guides and also BCCDC, I think all the, like maybe PHO as well, put out guides on how to care for a sick person in your household. And one of the things that's pretty generally recommended is that if you have a second bathroom, then that second bathroom should be just for that person. 
And if you don't have a second bathroom, then yeah, you need to be cleaning or the, the caretaker, care provider needs to be cleaning that bathroom after the ill person has used it. Yeah, the high contact, high touch surfaces such as, you know, toilet flush handles, your faucets, anything that you touch frequently, light switches, mm -hmm. um, should be cleaned at least two to three times a day if you have sick people in your household. Yeah, that the guide from I think it was Public Health Agency Canada about how to care for sick people was quite good. Um, we have a quite a lot, quite a few questions to go. We have about three minutes left. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, next question is about uh, fitness facilities to open windows to increase ventilation, given that there is possibility of increasing any potential plume spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so gyms have been a particularly interesting challenge. WorkSafe BC, I believe, has now put out um, recommendations on gyms, which BC CDC had a chance to comment on. Um, generally, for, for gyms, what seems to be important, or for example, if you have a gym where you have a whole bunch of people sweating together, yes, opening the windows is good. Increasing the outdoor air coming into the room is good. Uh, Getting a big air conditioner or a fan and pointing it down a line of people and turning it on and blowing all their particles into each other's breathing zones is not good. So though that's kind of like the one caveat is like, yes, ventilate, but uh, don't, don't do ventilation or don't do air conditioning things that connect people's breathing zones. Uh, you want to always try to, for example, if you had a room full of people, and this is something I'm thinking about for the extreme heat guidance. So if you had a cooling room in a building and you had four or five people allowed in the room, and you had an air conditioner going, you would want to cool the room, but don't let the air conditioner blow on people, like turn the air conditioner against a wall or against a, like some sort of clean surface so that the, the air, cool air is diffused out and not blasting down a line of people because of course that is exactly the sort of situation that could entrain somebody's droplets and carry them much farther than you would expect. Okay, next question was the effectiveness of Lysol and other disinfectants demonstrated specifically with COVID-19. So in my document on disinfectants, I do address that issue or that question. So it's also on our topic page, so feel free to take, it, take a look at it. Um, what factors make COVID-19 virus different from SARS virus, which is transmitted in multi-unit residential buildings? Uh, well, I wouldn't... Yeah, I don't want to comment on how similar or different they are in, in terms of transmission because we're still learning a lot about SARS-CoV-2 and it it is different. The, like the biggest factor, of course, is the amount of time it takes you to get sick and the amounts of the amount of time that a person is, is pre-symptomatic but potentially shedding virus. Those are the biggest differences between those virus and like it's the difference between an epidemic that was con contained and a pandemic that is now a pandemic. Um, in terms of the the Amway Gardens thing, again. This was, uh, I'm not gonna say it was a freak occurrence. It wasn't a freak occurrence. It was, it was, um, but it, it was a kind of an unusual conglomeration of things that got together where the virus wasn't easily aerosol. It required this mechanical failure and uh, you know, wind conditions and a whole bunch of things to come together in order for that virus to get aerosolized. If we're, if we're talking about you know, building an aerosol, a poop aerosolize, aerosolization machine in the middle of a big park, then yeah, that would be a really bad idea. Um, but this, that's not really, really what we're talking about here. It's, um, like aerosol generation from person to person. Is that happening with the Amway gardens? It was really kind of the next level because it was like a, a whole building failure thing that happened. It turned the whole building into a poop aerosol generating machine. Okay, great. Thanks to everyone. We're out of time. Um, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to email us at contact at ncch.ca and then we'll refer your questions to relevant staff to help you answer them.